Welcome back to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, the show that fuels your business success. I'm Brandon Gano, your host and guide through the world of harmonious business growth. Today, we're unlocking powerful strategies with industry experts to help your business thrive. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, you are in the right place. Join me and our incredible guest today on the journey to clarity, growth, and success. It is time to revolutionize your approach to business. Let's dive in with another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. Welcome back to some more bite-sized business advice, and we got a juicy one today. If you've been in business for more than three and a half seconds, you have likely heard that you need to write a book or something along those lines, publish something, and I'm not a fan of that narrative. I just got to tell you, it's not for everybody. It doesn't need to be for everybody. That's somebody selling you something, and today we are going to talk about three lies that the publishers will tell you, and we're going to disrupt the way you think about publishing a book self-publishing a book, publishing with a traditional publisher, all of that, it's all in question. Are we going to burn all of our books today on this episode? I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. I have an amazing guest, Wendy Melrose from In The Zone. Wendy, before we go any further, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a, a pleasure being here. So I am a fan of books. I'm not I'm not anti-book. Don't Let's not get confused here. But we do need to disrupt this, this mindset and this narrative that every single business, every single entrepreneur needs to write a book. So you help people publish their books, write their books, get it out into the world. We'll dive into more of that, but can we just first establish like who, who really should write a book? Why are we writing a book? Well, if we, if we go outside of the coaching and speakers realm and just say, you're just a mom, a dad, a friend, a sister or whatever. And you're like, I want to write a book and everybody wants to read my story. This is going to sound harsh, but they don't. Um, <laughs> So, like, I mean that in the most loving way. Do not spend $15,000 writing a book like that. Like, if you really want to write that book that you could pass on your legacy, like, totally do it. Do it yourself. And then I have ways for you to learn how to do it yourself and save all your money so that it's not five to $10,000 legacy to your kids. It's, it's your book that you want to share with your grandkids, all these different things. Like, I have ways to help you do that. Now, let's jump to the coaches and speakers. Do you need a book? <clears throat> I think it could be helpful if you are going to use it as a lead magnet, if you're going to use it as a support to what you're already doing with your clients. And it could give them almost kind of like a workbook type thing. So if if you if you're not going to get raw and vulnerable with your audience, don't bother writing your book because it'll be just like everybody else's. If you think I'm going to write a book and I'm going to have AI do it, don't bother. It's not it's going to be trash. And no one's going to like it. And you're going to get bad reviews. And that is not helpful to growing your business. <laughs> I like it. Before you started recording, would you say your nickname was The Hammer? The Hammer. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I like the nickname. I can see how you got it because it's true. Like, first of all, it, kudos to you for, for not saying that everyone has to write a book. Um, and I've seen so many people go down that path of just saying, I want to share my story. And I think everyone will want to read my story. Full disclosure, like I get a, a bajillion applications to this very show with people saying, I want to share my story. And I'm like, I don't care. And neither does the audience because your story is beneficial. If you can tell us how you can overcome, the audience can help overcome their struggles. But just to share your story with the world, like we're all egotistical maniacs. Nobody cares about your story. They care about them. So how can we relate your story to your audience, to the audience, that is what people are going to want to read. Help somebody overcome a problem. So, okay, step one, we got the foundation laid. The hammer is laying down foundations over here for us, Wendy. So, all right, if we decide now, we do want to use our book for this. It's it's a lead magnet. It's uh, it's going to help our clients through their journey. It's, it's a workbook, whatever it is. What's the next, like, what do we have to prepare for in, in getting ready to write a book? Because the other side of this is everyone goes into it saying they want to be a New York New York Times bestseller. And I think this is where the publishing lies start to come into play. So <laughs> you're already laughing. I can't wait. Hammer, take it away. <laughs> All right. So I didn't even know this like until a couple of weeks ago. Did you know that be a New York number one bestseller, you pay for it? It's not even a real thing. Mm -hmm. I, I actually awesome. did know that. I've, I've talked to <laughs> a number of authors who actually were New York Times bestsellers. Uh, along with the Amazon thing, which I'm sure you'll get into in a minute. And it's all fake. Everything's fake. It's so fake. And 
you know, people are just like, but everybody wants me to be a number one bestseller. You don't. <clears throat> There's a way. Like, here's the thing. If you achieve it organically, congratulations. Does it mean that you are successful? It might. Does it mean you are a failure if you don't hit number one? It does not. So just keep in mind, if you're going to be number one on Amazon, it's a category keyword hack. And you want to make sure that you uh, uh, write a book within a niche that people actually care about. If you're like, I'm going to write about trees in Missouri. Nobody cares. But if you have a way to say how trees can help provide food for your family in the apocalypse, they might care. So you'd have to, you know, because we just got through the whole like eclipse thing. Yesterday, everybody thought everyone was going to die or the rapture was going to happen. So like, here's the thing. Do not write a book and, oh, I'm going to jump a second. Do not pay someone to get the status. That's stupid. Because here's the thing. There are people who are like, I can help you get to number one international bestseller. Who freaking cares? Because even if you get it, it doesn't mean you sold a bunch of books. Like, I'm a number one bestseller in 60 categories. Who cares? How many books have you sold? Like, what is your goal? Is it so that you can have that status? Fine. I can connect you with a team that can help you. Like, but the thing is, is you're going to have to make sure everybody buys on the same day so you can beat the person in the category that's above you so it's like because you know they're going to figure out like okay we need to sell about 100 books to hit number one so you sold 100 books congratulations or you had sold 101 books so just know just because you hit number one bestseller doesn't mean you're successful just because you don't hit number one bestseller doesn't mean you're not yeah and it's it's all gaming the system which i'm, I'm familiar with again because i've i've seen behind the scenes um, I mentioned before we started recording, my, my wife helped people. She worked for a company that helped people self-publish the books. So I'm very familiar with the games. And the one thing that I always like couldn't understand was, okay, so you sold 101 books on, on one day and then your sales go to basically zero, but averaged out over the rest of forever because most people don't continue to use it. So in terms of money, which should not be your focus of writing a book, but in, in terms of money, you've made roughly $400 woohoo you're not going to recoup your investment um and in terms of impact your book is in the hands of 101 people it, that's really probably not going to make an impact either so in terms of becoming a number one bestseller both on amazon internationally new york new york times there's got to be some like marketing component to that right because not everybody realizes it's a game and you can pay for it what what are the pros and the cons from people outside of uh, you know, without your knowledge, if you will, what are the benefits? And then I also want to talk about then what should we really be doing? But let's start with the, the pros and cons of, of the marketing aspect of it. Of marketing in general? No, of, of just of saying, being able to say that you are a New York Times bestseller or an Amazon number one bestseller for those people who aren't familiar with the game. Um, I mean, it does give an idea of success, right? So it's not like it's a bad thing. It's just, I don't want to encourage anyone to spend a lot of money for something, right? Because yeah. it's amazing how we, you know, because on Amazon, it, it isn't just as simple as getting, sometimes getting the category in keywords, right? You also have to make sure your cover is perfect. You have to make sure your description is perfect. You want to make sure you eat plus content, which is if you're in a book on Amazon, you scroll down way to the bottom, you've got all these fancy pictures and stuff and descriptions of what your book is about. You want to be better than your competitor. Well, that takes a lot of money. So the marketing in of it itself, it, you just have to decide for yourself, is it something that I really want? Am I going to get my money back for having this type of title? Is my audience in and of itself going to care if I'm number one or international or Amazon bestseller? And you have to decide for yourself. And this also might hurt a little bit you have to put your pride aside. You know, you have to be able to go, am I doing this for you to honor my audience, to honor God, or am I doing it to puff myself up? So it can be a little painful. That should be a question you ask before you do anything, yeah. not just before you write a book. That's a valuable question. to Check right. yourself before you wreck yourself, right? right. Um, so, okay. So th that makes a lot of sense. Now walk me through, um, 
who like when we're going through the process of writing a book, if we've established, okay, no, this is for the audience. This will serve somebody else. Um, I will help somebody through a pain, through a problem or achieve a success. I know I need to write a book. Fantastic. How do we go about, like, how do you help your clients decide what is the book going to be about? How do I go about distributing this and getting it out to the right audience? Like there's this whole big process that I don't think people really consider. And that's probably where the lies from the publishers come in because they're sold that it's like this done for you package book in a box system. And I assume it's not. So help, help me navigate that. Uh, so yeah. Um, one of the best ways to describe it is um, at the event I just held Dallas Adamsman. He is a speaker here in St. Louis. He described pain to promise and the, the stuff in between is your book. So if you've got a real pain to promise story that, you know, through your pain, you also can carry people to a promise wherever this camera is. Um, then you've got something that people are going to be able to really use and to grow from. So I help them like in my different strategies, I help people go from like, you're like, but how do you tap into the pain? I have a certain exercises that I do. And if I can get to the point where you're boohooing, like, I look, like, you know, like really vulnerably, there's your pain. But then where is your promise? Where are you now? How, what did God do to get you from here to here? And anything in between that are the steps <clears throat> that you can guide your audience to. So let's just say, we are there and we've figured out pain to promise. Then we don't just wait to start marketing when the book's finished. We start marketing now. Hey, coming soon. Because a lot of times if we already have an audience or we don't have an audience, we start creating one. We start marketing on LinkedIn, on TikTok, on podcasts, because our, like you said, nobody cares about your story unless you can change people's lives. So, then, you know, as we start sharing our story in our lives, you get on podcasts, start your own podcast, create an audience, you know, start figuring out like sharing on Facebook lives, getting vulnerable. One of my clients is a, is a TikToker. She's got over 75,000 followers. And that's what I'm like, I go, what you share with your TikTok audience is where your book is because you are raw with those people mm -hmm. and they care and they know that you can help them through what you've been through. And so I go, we're going to start talking to them how you've got a book coming, how you've got a book coming. And you can't really talk about it enough. You can also start building like your email lists. And, you know, there, there's like a whole little like marketing strategy with it. And it can get a little complex or it can be simple. It's just, just don't stop talking about it, you know, and start saying coming soon. And, or you can start sharing like, hey, this is what I'm going to talk about in this chapter. Or like start giving things away because people get excited about it. Yeah, that, that's a good strategy. And I, I honestly, um, that was one of the things that always bothered me when I hear people going the, you know, the self-publishing, going to be number one Amazon bestseller or whatever. Um, it was it was people getting sold into thinking that the book is the thing and that'll that's what will build your audience. Um, and obviously that's that's a lie, but I'm, I'm yeah. curious, like what is, if someone wants to use a book, what are, what are the right, you know, ballpark, ballparking metrics, obviously 75,000 followers is a lot, but you also can't launch a book to an audience of zero because nothing will happen. So where do you like people to be before, before they launch a book? Because I think this actually crosses over into launching a business or launching a product. There's a lot of overlap here and we usually don't think about it. We said, you said this, I don't know if it was on the recording or right before, but if you build it, they will come that principle is just not true, especially with a book. So where do you like people to fall? Um, I don't know if there's a magic number. I wish you could, I could say that I, I know where the magic number is on how much impact. All I know is we can't always control people's response. We can control our actions. And if we're taking time, getting to know people in groups, not pitching them, do not message people like, Hey, I've got a book. Nobody cares. People want to know, I saw you make this comment about this. Tell me a little bit more about your story because the more, I know it's a little cliche, but the more you show people they care, you care, the more they want to get to know you. And don't be, don't be shady about it. Don't be fake about it. Don't be like, I'm going to make them think that I care, but I really don't. They're going to buy my book. Just forget it. Like if, if you have the wrong motives behind what you're doing, it's just never going to work. And so 
I would love to say I know the magic number, but really it's just, just get started, just start going. And, you know, I've only been crafting my message for, for about three months, like really in the zone part. Like I've been working on publishing and figuring out like all that for about a year, but the in the zone and up itself, what God has taught me and where I'm starting to help others. But you know, my engagement's up 46,000 in 30 days because I've really upped my messaging. So sometimes it might hire, may require hiring a coach to get your messaging down correct. You know, don't try to just do things yourself. And so while they're like, but that costs money. I know it costs money, but how fast do you want to get to where you're going? So. Yeah, that's, that's always what I say is you, you can do it yourself and figure it out, or you can pay someone and shave years if not decades off of that experimentation very very wise especially for something as intricate as as a book but all right i'm curious i i have to know um before we get to if people decide that if they want to work with you where should they find you how should they go about doing that what give me an example of um something totally outside the box because i think a book by itself really cool on the surface that's fantastic you have a book you're an author give me an example of how someone used the book in a very creative and unique way and, and grew their business that way or, or grew their reach, their speaking in that way. Do you have some success stories from clients? Well, one of the uh, books that I helped co-author was called Peanut Butter and Jesus. And uh, it's right <laughs> Wait, wait, do, do those two things go together? Peanut Butter and Jesus, that's fantastic. <laughs> so it's a creative way for this ministry to share the gospel of Jesus Christ using a peanut butter and jelly sandwich as an object lesson. And so Jeffrey Crom has been using, has been taking this book everywhere he goes. And so then now there are restaurants who now have a PB&J special <laughs> and they have to be able to share the gospel it's really kind of neat and so it is a creative way and sometimes it might be like you know some people might think this is like you know evil to talk about jesus as a peanut butter and jelly sandwich it's really fun but the thing is is that that was a creative solution to help reach people in a creative way to spread the gospel of jesus christ and now it's opening doors at different like ministry opportunities and you know, a great way to speak to children because they love peanut butter and jelly. And so, yeah, that's a fun example. I like it. I think that's fantastic. I was I was not expecting you to say that. That's one of the most uh, interesting and creative examples I've ever heard. Um, and we'll put that, I'll make sure Wendy sends that sends me the link for that book. We'll put it in the show notes as well. Um, and now also I want to I want to talk about you and where to find you. I have your website on the screen. And for those of you listening, that will also be in the show notes wherever you're listening, along with peanut butter and Jesus. Um, but <laughs> Wendy, if somebody wants to, um, you know, figure out and and really talk through the process of what it takes to write a book, should they write a book? Is their message worthy of helping people through a book? Um, you have a variety of of options for people. Talk to me about how how can people reach out and take that first step with you. So if it's something that you just want to like, I just have to talk with her. You're welcome to email me. You can schedule a call with me. They'll on that. So I'll love books.com. They'll be like schedule a call. Um, also there are, I have a free community on Facebook called not yet authors, you know, feel free to go in there. If you like, I, I don't know where to start. Like it's a great way to just kind of ask questions, see what content I put in there. I just added a checklist today um on like where to start because a lot of times people think they know you know what they all need to do to self-publish but they don't and they're like wow this is really helpful so I'll, I'll be like also creating some different videos on how to get on kdp how to you know get your isbn your copyright and so um you know any way that i can add value without you having to spend money that's going to be something i want to be able to do for everybody and then, you know, working with me directly, that can always be done by like just starting with the conversation. So that's fantastic. What what would you say before I let you go here, before we wrap up, what what would you say is the most common question people have when they when they first reach out to you if they decide they want to reach a, write a book? Um, the most common question I would have to say is do do I have to go through a publisher in order to to you know, to write a book and like, you know, nobody takes self publishers seriously. I'm going to push back on that because it isn't true anymore. There's a lot of indie bookstores. There's even places where libraries will even take indie, indie books. I think the indie space is going to become even more prevalent as time goes on. 
um, especially as the lies and deception is exposed more in the publishing world because you just assume, hey, like they took me on, they're gonna help me. But you you pay a lot of money and they, you're still having to do all the work. So instead, control your money, find someone who's gonna tell you what the raw costs are so you know where your dollar is going. And then if you have to do the marketing anyway, you may as well be a self-publisher and keep all your rights and the most amount of your money versus going to a publisher where you lose your rights and your money. Yeah, that's that's very important too. Just from a, a risk perspective, if, if you outsource the publishing, you usually sign over a lot of the rights to your creative material. So yeah. just something to think about. If you have a story, if you think you want to write a book, talk to an expert first. Go reach out to Wendy. Uh, again, all the links that we talked about today are in the show notes. Wendy, thank you so much for being here and, and sharing, shedding a light on this topic. You're welcome. And just remember this point. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. <laughs> oh, man. Mic drop. I'm not going to say anything else other than subscribe. Make sure you come back for the next episode, Wendy. Thank you. That was fantastic. You're welcome.